Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this special freshwater stewardship community webinar. We're really excited to have Heather Pollowick from Birds Canada here with us to finish off our Community Science Month. My name is Monica Seidel. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada. And I also have another coworker with me here today, Nicole Dubay, who is our Freshwater Health Coordinator. And she is going to be helping everyone in the chat. And if you're having any technology problems, you can send her a private message. If you have any questions for the Q&A at the end of the session, you can also send them directly to Nicole and she'll be compiling all of those for the end of the presentation. For those of you joining us maybe for the first time for our freshwater stewardship community, we are Watersheds Canada. We're a national nonprofit and charitable organization based in Eastern Ontario. And we focus on delivering many different stewardship and habitat restoration projects that benefit the health of Canada's lakes, rivers, and shorelines. So you can see a sampling of them on this screen here. We do things like lake assessments and shoreline plantings. We also do habitat restoration, especially for different fish species. And a number of our programs are also being delivered in classrooms and with informal educators and waterfront associations. And so these all have the same goal of connecting people with their local nature, especially their local fresh water, and giving them tools and programs so that they can take action to protect these areas for generations to come. One of our outreach programs that is a bit newer is this freshwater stewardship community that we're here for today. And it was launched in 2021, looking at providing a wide variety of stakeholders with different resources and networking opportunities so that they could protect their freshwater areas. So we've had speakers from the nonprofit sector, from businesses, academia, different waterfront and community associations as well, and individuals, all with different topics surrounding freshwater health. So. Since 2021, we've held 35 webinars, and many of these webinars have corresponding handouts, which are a one-page summary of that webinar and also have a pretty extensive additional resources section, which gives you kind of a next step on that issue from the webinar. So you can look at joining different programs or with a local association, Many different additional reading lists have been put on those and all of the webinars and handouts have been archived on the Freshwater Stewardship Community page, which is where you registered for today's event. And they're also sorted by different categories. So depending on the topic you're interested in, you can search through. So I would encourage you after today's webinar to go check out all of the other resources that are there. They're all free and they are all welcome to be shared. So you can post them anywhere you'd like and with as many people as you'd like so that we can get these tools in the hands of lots of people. This is the end of April, which is pretty wild. This month we've been hosting a community science focused mini series. And so if you've missed any of these wonderful webinars, they are on our website. And they are all focused on community science. So as we approach the warmer weather, as slow as it's taking, it is coming. And we'll be able to contribute to all these different community science programs. So this is a great resource if you are looking to get out with your family or get uh, your community involved and engaged. There are lots of different ones that were featured this past month. And each of them have their corresponding handout, like I mentioned. So I encourage you to go to watersheds.ca slash freshwater hyphen stewardship to access all of these different resources. We also have an upcoming webinar in a few weeks time for World Turtle Day. So this will be featuring David Seaburn from the Canadian Wildlife Federation and talking about the different turtle species that are found in Canada, the threats that they're facing, and how individuals can take action. And this will be timely with turtle nesting season and when they're trying to cross roads. So if you are interested in attending that webinar, registration is now live on our website, and that webinar will take place on Tuesday, May 23rd. 
And this is the handout that you will be getting early next week, which is related to the presentation we have here today. And it's a great summary of what Heather's going to be talking about, as well as a number of different community science programs that people can participate in, as well as other actions that you can take to protect local bird populations in your community. With this handout, you'll also get the recording from today's session and any other resources that are shared, uh, such as our Natural Edge program. So you can look forward to that email early next week in your inbox. So with all of that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Heather Polowick, who is the Bank Swallow Conservation Coordinator for Birds Canada. She has studied forest bird species at risk, monitored the foraging behavior of aerial insectivores over wetlands, and assisted with a captive breeding pro program for loggerhead shrike. Heather now coordinates the Atlantic Canada Bank Swallow Working Group, a group of stakeholders working together to help conserve bank swallow populations. So with that, Heather, I'll invite you to take over the screen share. Great, thanks, Monica. Hi, everyone. Just give me one second here to share my screen. Still working okay? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Heather Polowick and I'm the Bank Swallow Conservation Coordinator for Birds Canada. And I'm actually based out of Atlantic Canada, despite living here in Ontario. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you about aerial insectivores and more specifically the chimney swift and the bank swallow and their connection to watersheds. So I'm joining you from Waterloo, Ontario, the current and traditional lands of Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Neutral People, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe. This territory is covered by the Haldimand Treaty of 1784 and Treaty 3 from 1792. Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. We gratefully support the needs, aspirations, and rights of the Indigenous peoples that care for this land. For today's presentation, I'll cover a little bit about Birds Canada and our mission, what defines aerial insectivores, and what their current status is in Canada. Then a little overview of flycatchers, nightjars, and other swallow species that we have in Eastern Canada. Next, I will talk about our focus species, the chimney swift and the bank swallow, including identification, status, and life history. Then I will explain the threats these birds are facing, and we will end on a positive note with our current conservation initiatives and what individuals like you can do to help. And lastly, there will be time for questions. So Birds Canada is a not-for-profit organization built on the contributions of thousands of members, volunteers, and citizen scientists. Our mission at Birds Canada is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada through scientific research, innovative partnerships, public engagement, science-based advocacy, and on-the-ground actions. And together with our supporters, we are Canada's voice for, voice for birds. So you may be asking, why study and focus on birds? Well, birds provide a number of beneficial services to humans and other animals. They pollinate plants, they eat fruits and then disperse the seeds, which helps plants and trees spread across the landscape and they help control insect populations. Birds are also great indicator species of healthy ecosystems because they have specific requirements for habitats and are easy to see and monitor. This means by studying birds, we can learn about the quality and health of habitats and notice changes to those habitats quickly, and then hopefully protect them before it's too late. Many birds are also considered an umbrella species. Uh, the term umbrella species is a species that when protected leads to the protection of many other species. And birds are great for this, thanks to their large ranges and their migratory paths. 
And lastly, birds are beautiful and their songs fill our forests and backyards, which create a great connection to nature that benefit human mental health and well being. So, on to our focus today what are aerial insectivores? Aerial insectivores are a group of birds that catch insect while in flight. This group includes nightjars, such as the Eastern Whippoorwill and common nighthawk, flycatchers, such as the Acadian flycatcher and all of sided flycatcher, and lastly, swallows and swifts, such as the barn swallow and purple martin. Because of their nest, sorry, because of their insect eating strategies, aerial insectivores spend most of their time in flight and their bodies are built perfectly for this lifestyle. They have long wings, short beaks, big eyes for spotting insects, short legs, and they typically have shorter necks. All of these features add up to make these birds amazing flyers. They are migratory, spending their summers in North America and flying south for the winter. And unfortunately, this group is at risk. Which brings us to their status in Canada. How at risk are aerial insectivores? Using nearly 50 years of data, the 2019 State of Canada's Birds Report shows that Canada has lost 59% of aerial insectivore populations. As you can see in this graph, we are losing aerial insectivore species at a faster rate than any other bird group in Canada. Over the last 10 years, 80% of the newly, of this bird species newly listed as threatened or endangered in Canada were aerial insectivores. But this graph also shows how effective conservation can work, as we can see an increase in birds of prey and waterfowl, thanks to collective action to conserve these species. Now we will take a closer look at the family groups within the aerial insectivore group of birds. I will start off with a brief, brief overview of flycatchers and nightjars. So Eastern Canada has several species of flycatcher, which are all listed here. The asterisks indicate the two species that are at risk in Canada, the Acadian flycatcher, which is listed as endangered, and the olive-sided flycatcher, which is listed as threatened. Flycatchers are notoriously difficult to identify. Many of the species look similar, and some can only be identified by song, like the Acadian flycatcher and the, sorry, like the alder flycatcher and the willow flycatcher. Further, some of these species can only be identified by using an equation involving wing and tail measurements. Flycatchers prefer forests and grasslands near rivers and streams, like the Acadian flycatcher that nests in hemlocks in undisturbed forest ravine habitats. Their preference for undisturbed forests makes, them, makes their presence a really good indicator of a healthy forest. However, this is also what's leading to their decline as less and less forests remain undisturbed by humans. All of sided flycatchers prefer open edges of forests and are often found in recently burned forests. Uh, it's assumed that the dead trees may make it easier for these birds to catch insects. Flycatchers are also more easily monitored through our national programs, such as the Breeding Bird Survey, and they are less dependent on human habitats than our focus species, which is why they are not our focus today. So Eastern Canada has two species of nightjar, the Eastern Whippoorwill, which is listed as threatened, and the common nighthawk, which is listed as special concern. Eastern Whippoorwills will breed in dry, deciduous, and mixed forests with no understory and lots of open space to hunt for insects. Common nighthawks nest in natural and urban areas such as beaches, coastal sand dunes, rocky river edges, and they will also nest on flat gravel rooftops if available. So you could see these birds right in town. These birds are either crepuscular, meaning they are most active at dusk and dawn, or nocturnal, meaning they're active at night, making them a little bit more difficult to see than other birds. And despite their name, the common nighthawk is actually crepuscular, so active during dusk and dawn, and not active at night. They are also not common as a species at risk, and they are also not a hawk. So their name is a little bit of a, a confusing name. <laughs> and um, the Eastern whippoorwills are nocturnal. In addition to being active when most of us are not, nightjars are also excellent at blending into nature, which makes them even more difficult to see. But thankfully, they're easy to hear during their active times. 
In these two pictures, you can see that night jars have small bills, but they actually have huge mouths that are able to eat large moths and insects. And night jars are currently monitored in our Canadian night jar, night jar survey, which I will discuss a little later on. Next, a brief overview of the other swallow species that can be found in Eastern Canada, and I'll talk about bank swallows in a separate section. So first we have barn swallows. Barn swallows have metallic blue upper parts, cinnamon colored underparts, rusty colored throat and forehead with long, deeply forked tails. Barn swallows forage over agricultural fields, grasslands and wetlands, and they often roost with other swallow species in wetlands during migration stopovers. The term roost means to, refers to where swifts and swallows congregate to rest at night. When breeding, pair, when breeding begins, pairs will often roost together in their nest. Barn swallows nest on cross beams and eaves of sheds, barns, stables, under bridges and culverts, although historically these nests would have been built in caves. They build cup-shaped nests out of mud, making between five to 42 mud collecting trips per hour over an average of 15 days, based on a study done in British Columbia. Barn swallows are often also known to play, something that I've actually witnessed once in a wetland, uh, watching a couple of young barn swallows collect and drop the wind-blown cottonwood seeds, swooping all around, practicing their insect hunting skills. It's pretty fun to watch. So barn swallows were listed as threatened in 2011, but the status was re-examined and they are now listed as special concern in Canada. And the population currently appears to be stable. Special concern means that the species may become threatened or endangered without conservation action. Cliff swallows have dark blue upper parts with cinnamon rumps, rusty faces, and a whitish forehead. Cliff swallows build enclosed nests out of mud under cliff bridges, under cliffs, bridges, and on building ledges, and they are a colony species often forming groups of 200 to 1,000 or more nests in one location. Sometimes females will lay eggs in other nests or even carry an egg in its bill over to another female's nest. They build nests close to foraging sites, such as agricultural fields, grasslands, and other open areas. Cliff swallows will rest in the nest once it's complete and in trees during the non-breeding season. Cliff swallows will watch others in the colony and follow individuals that catch the best prey. And sometimes during poor weather conditions, if an individual finds food, they can give a specific call alerting the others in the colony to come in and feast on the food source. They are currently listed as least concern in Canada, but the population is declining. However, there's currently not enough information about their population to make a firm decision. Tree swallows have blue-green upperparts with blackish wing feathers and bright white underparts. Tree swallows often nest in nest boxes like the one pictured on the bottom right, near lakes, wetlands, farms, and grasslands. Historically and when available, they nest in trees with cavities, usually created by other birds like woodpeckers. Tree swallows are highly social and will migrate in large groups and nest close together when enough cavities are available. However, tree swallows are also fairly territorial, preferring to be roughly three, 30 feet apart when it comes to next nest boxes, though facing the nest box holes in different directions or placing obstacles in between the ne nest boxes can shorten this distance. They forage over wetlands, grasslands, and other open areas. During migration, tree swallows can be seen in huge flocks of hundreds of thousands of individuals, at dusk to roost in wetlands or sparsely treed areas. Tree swallows are currently listed as least concern in Canada, although their population is also declining. Male purple martins have iridescent dark blue purple bodies with brown black wings and tails. The females and males look different with the females being duller overall with gray on their head and chest. Purple martins are our are, are lar largest species, swallow species. Purple martins live almost exclusively near cities and towns and often use nest boxes for nesting. They are colony nesters with multiple nests located in 
spe specially designed Purple Martin boxes. They forage over cities, towns, parks, and other open areas. And Purple Martins also gather and roost in large flocks during migration. The status of the Purple Martins in Canada is least concern, although their population is also declining, with the Breeding Bird Survey showing that the population has declined by just under 50% nationally, and in the lower Great Lakes region, the population has declined by over 90%. Northern Ruffling Swallows have brown bodies with a lighter throat and chest that fades to white. They get their names from the tiny hooks on the leading edge of their primary feathers. We are not sure what purpose these rough wings serve for these birds, but they do have them. Lastly, for swallows besides the bank swallow, so sorry, this is the last swallow before the bank swallow, they nest in burrows, but they use burrows that have been created by other animals, such as kingfishers, bank swallows, and squirrels. They mostly nest along rivers and streams, but will also nest in crevices like gutters and drain pipes. Northern ruffling swallows prefer to nest away from others and are fairly territorial, but can nest in small groups and along the edges of bank swallow colonies. They forage in open areas, often over water. The status of the nor Northern ruffling swallow is least concern in Canada, although their population is also declining. Now let's get to know the two species that are declining the fastest in this group a little better, starting with the chimney swift. The chimney swift has shown a severe long-term decline with Canada losing close to 90% of the population since 1970. In response to this decline, chimney swifts were federally designated as threatened in 2007 and confirmed in 2018. This means that chimney swifts are likely to become endangered without conservation action. Chimney swifts, often called a cigar with wings, have dark gray-brown tube-shaped bodies with a slightly paler throat. Females and males look identical, except that males tend to be slightly heavier. The chimney swift belongs to the Apodidae family, which means footless. Although they do have feet, this name refers to the fact that chimney swifts can't perch on branches like the birds we see in our backyards. They can only cling to vertical surfaces. They spend their entire day flying and foraging for insects over urban areas, rivers, lakes, fields, and forests, eating upwards of a thousand insects per day. The chimney swifts that visit Canada spend their winters in South America. They begin the spring migration around March and nest in Canada from May to August when they begin their fall migration back to South America. Chimney swifts nest in cavities. Historically, they were adapted to large old growth trees with hollow cavities. However, as human landscapes continued to spread and old growth forests disappeared, chimney swifts adapted to chimneys. They can also use barn silos, rock crevices, and sometimes wells for nesting. Chimney swifts nest in pairs or sometimes have juvenile helpers and will often roost in their nest chimney at night. As we learned for many swallow species, roof sites are wetlands where mixed species will congregate, providing safety in numbers. But for chimney swifts, roof sites are chimneys, often gathering in large groups, ranging from a few individuals to several thousand in one chimney. Chimney swifts are ready for breeding when they are two years old. They form a seasonally monogamous pair and will often return to the same nesting site year after year. Their nests are made with glue-like saliva and twigs stuck to the inside of a chimney, and they have an average of four eggs per clutch, and they can have one to two broods per season. So now on to bank swallows. Bank swallows, unfortunately, are the species declining at the fastest rate within the group of aerial insectivores. The Federal Bank Swallow Recovery Strategy states that over the last 50 years, Canada has lost 98% of its bank swallow populations. Bank swallows were listed as threatened across Canada in 2017 under the Species at Risk Act. Bank swallows are the smallest swallow species in Canada. They have dark brown upperparts and white underparts with a large brown band across the chest which is the key feature when identifying bank swallows from other swallow species. And males and females look identical. 
Their scientific name, Riparia riparia, means of the riverbank and refers to their nesting habitat, which is in eroding banks, generally along rivers, lakes, or coastal cliffs. They are one of the most widely distributed birds in the world, found on every continent except Antarctica and Australia. In many parts of its range, the bank swallow is called the sand martin. Bank swallows breed in Canada in the southern half of the and the southern half of the U.S. during our summer months. In mid to late August, they begin their fall migration back to the, their wintering grounds in South America. They stay in South America, mainly in the southern cone grasslands until February when spring migration back to Canada begins and they begin searching for their nesting habitat. Bank swallows forage from dusk till dawn, often over lakes, rivers, and other water bodies or grasslands that support a diversity of aerial insects. They roost or rest during the day or night in a communal mixed species box, often in wetlands. Bank swallows look for sandy or loose substrate near vertical embankments along ocean coasts, lakes, rivers, and other wetlands for nesting. When suitable habitat is found, the male will dig a burrow roughly 60 to 90 centimeters deep into the bank using his bill and his feet over four to five days. Once he's finished with that, the female will come in and do the nest building. Bank swallows have three to five eggs per clutch and can have one to two broods per season. Besides nesting in natural embankments, bank swallows will nest in human-created artificial habitat made from walls with perfectly sized tubes and in aggregate pits and quarries. Bank swallows begin breeding when they're about two years old and they have high site fidelity, meaning they tend to return to the same breeding sites year after year. They are colony nesters and will nest in groups ranging from a few individuals to thousands. So now on to the less fun stuff, the threats. I will discuss the threats that all aerial insectivores face and then some specific threats that our focus species face. So why are aerial insectivores declining at such an alarming rate? In many ways, aerial insectivores are facing death by a thousand cuts. This includes a global decline of aerial insects, their food source, due to an increasing use of pesticides, climate change, and habitat loss. And aerial insectivores themselves are facing habitat loss and degradation due to intensive agriculture, industry, forestry, and urban development and they are also directly facing the many impacts of climate change. So let's start with the global decline of insects. Insects are declining across the globe due to an increase in pesticide use, habitat loss, and climate change. Pesticide use has increased as humans switched from small diversified crop farms to large monoculture or one crop farms. Monoculture farms require more pesticides, than diverse farms because the reduced diversity of crops reduce the diversity of insects that a farm can support. A reduction in insect diversity throws off the natural systems in place that keep populations balanced, often leading to an outbreak in one species of pest that is further controlled by more pesticides. The shift in insect diversity and abundance affects aerial insectivores. For example, a study from 2012 looking at well-preserved chimney swift poop found that their prey source had shifted since 1944. The researchers noticed less coloptera or beetle remains and more hemptera or true bug remains in the chimney swift poop. Beetles are the preferred food of aerial insectivores as they have a higher caloric value, meaning birds have to eat less of them to sustain their energy. True bugs, however, have a lower caloric value, meaning aerial insectivores have to forage for longer to get enough calories. This is concerning because it takes energy to catch prey, so the adults could have a net loss of energy when foraging on true bugs alone. The authors of the study argued that heavy use of DDT had decimated the beetle populations by the 1960s, leading to this drastic prey shift in chimney swifts. DDT is a non-selective insecticide, meaning it could kill any species of insect that it came into contact with, and it was heavily used in North America until it was banned in 1972. You might know DDT as the main cause of decline for bald eagles and peregrine falcons, which led to the, the ban of DDT and also 
partially the increase in, in their populations as well that we saw in the first couple of slides there. The conversion of breeding habitats, such as forests, grasslands, and wetlands to human landscapes is limiting the amount of available breeding habitat for insects. The loss of wetlands as breeding habitats for insects is especially concerning for aerial insectivores as emergent aquatic insects have higher concentrations of beneficial fatty acids than terrestrial insect species. When aerial insectivore offspring are fed more emergent aquatic insects, the food improves the growth and success of the nestlings. Like all animals, insects evolves in, evolved in certain types of habitats and environmental conditions they can thrive in. As temperatures change, insect ranges are shifting and shrinking, forcing, forcing insects to move, adapt, or decline. A study published in 2022 in Nature Climate Change found that because of climate change, 65% of insect populations could go extinct over the next century. Climate change is also impacting insect bird relations by causing a phenological mismatch between birds and insects. A phenological mismatch is when interacting species change the timing of their regularly repeated phases in their life cycles at different rates. For example, birds and insects use changes in the amount of daylight, food abundance, and temperature as cues for their life cycles. When days are shorter, temperatures are cooler, and food availability declines in South America, birds begin to migrate to their breeding grounds in Canada. At the same time, insects in Canada have warmer, longer days triggering their next life cycle phase. Aerial insectivores have evolved with insects to arrive and breed during peak adult insect abundance. However, with climate change, seasonal cues may come earlier or later for insects or for birds. So the timing between peak insect abundance and peak breeding bird season could no longer line up. This can have devastating impacts on nestling survival rates and on the number of attempted nests per breeding season if food is a limiting factor. Climate change is also directly impacting aerial insectivore populations by creating more unpredictable and intense storms that can damage important habitats and blow migratory birds off course, like Hurricane Wilma in 2005, which moved thousands of birds off course to Western Europe, including several hundred ch chimney swifts. The next year, chimney swift populations had declined by half of what it was the year before the storm. Climate change can also cause heavy rain and wind events and sudden temperature changes above or below normal seasonal temperatures that can cause nest failures. In addition to the global loss of insects and impacts from climate change, aerial insects, aerial insectivores are facing habitat loss of their own. Breeding, foraging, and roosting habitats such as forests, grasslands, and wetlands are being converted to human land use. Wetlands, important foraging and roosting sites for many species of, aer of aerial insectivores are being lost at a faster rate than other habitats. It is estimated that about 70% of wetlands have been lost in southern areas of Canada, with densely populated areas having lost 95% of their wetlands. This is leaving aerial insectivores with less space to eat, rest, and breed successfully. And this habitat loss is not just happening in Canada, but across their migratory paths and in their wintering grounds. Habitat loss for breeding chimney swifts looks a little different than some of the other aerial insectivores because it includes changes to urban areas. So again, as humans cleared old growth forests and replaced them with brick houses, chimneys, chimney swifts adapted to brick chimneys. However, modern houses and safety regulations are changing and houses are being built with chimney, chimney lining and chimney caps, preventing chimney swifts from nesting in them. Further, many houses are also being built without masonry chimneys, further decreasing the amount of available nesting and roosting habitat for chimney swifts. Lastly, chimney swift habitat in South America is being reduced by logging, forest fires, agricultural practices, and development. For bank swallows, additional threats to their breeding habitat come in the form of rock armoring. The picture on the left shows an example of rock armoring, which involves using cement or large rocks to create a wall between the land and the eroding, eroding force of water. 
This method of preventing erosion not only directly prevents bank swells from nesting in the eroding vertical surface, but it can also prevent the creation of new potential nesting habitats. This is because erosion is a natural process that is necessary for the movement of sediments that create coastal and river habitats, such as beaches, dunes, and coastal cliffs. Bank swallows Bank swallow breeding habitat is further at risk because of climate change, creating an increase in the severity and frequency of intense storms, which can increase the rate of erosion and cause burrows to collapse. To show a recent example of how much storm surges can impact bank swallow nesting habitat, here are photos from PEI National Park before and after Hurricane Fiona in 2022 where they saw months worth of erosion occur in just hours. PEI National Park says it's the worst damage to their dune systems in close to a century. Storms like this can make banks and shorelines too unstable for bank swallows to nest in. So what's being done to help conserve chimney swifts, bank swallows, and other aerial insectivores? In both Ontario and the Maritimes, we have the Switch Watch programs which started in 2010 and are based on the participation of volunteers and landowners. Some of our project par partners are also in Quebec, Manitoba, and the US. The goal of SwiftWatch is to monitor chimney swift routes and nest sites, as well as support habitat stewardship to identify long-term population trends and evaluate the effectiveness of conservation actions. We engage volunteer citizen scientists and partners to locate and monitor nest and roost sites, and we help landowners steward chimney swift habitat. Birds Canada also helps facilitate the Chimney Swift Fund, which can provide funding for applicants to help repair their chimneys to keep them swift friendly. This fund began in 2022, and already five important chimneys for chimney swifts have been repaired and we'll know the success of these repairs this summer as chimney swifts return to their breeding grounds across Canada. For bank swallows, Birds Canada is researching the species in a number of ways. In Ontario, in the summer of 2022, Birds Canada staff were capturing bank swallows to ban them, which helps estimate the survival of adults and juvenile birds. They also put modus tags on some individuals. And modus tags, if you're not familiar, are basically radio tags. They send out a pulse, pulsing signal, and when the bird flies past a modus tower, the tower pings it and we get a point on a map. With enough points and enough modus towers, the locations of which are marked in this map in the yellow dots, we can follow their migration path. They also collected feather samples that can be used for an isotopic analysis, which can tell us a ton of different information from where the bird hatched to what makes up the majority of the bird's diet. In 2022 in Atlantic Canada, we launched the Atlantic Canada Bank Swallow Monitoring Project. This project is designed to cover all of Atlantic Canada and locate and monitor all known bank swallow colonies every year. We are working with partners and organizations across the region to help us achieve this monitoring goal. This map shows some of the current colonies we know about and the red markers indicate that someone has registered to monitor those colonies each year. Also in Atlantic Canada, we are working on promoting alternatives to rock armoring, a huge threat to breeding bank swallows. Currently in Atlantic Canada, rock armoring or using cement walls or blocks to prevent shoreline erosion is very common. We are working with partners and volunteers to create an example of a living shoreline site. Living shorelines is a technique for shoreline stabil stabilization using a combination of natural materials such as coastal plants, wood debris, and rock placed strategically to slow wave action and protect the shore. And the best part, living shorelines actually get stronger over time as the native plant roots grow and stabilize more and more soil, unlike rock armoring, which often requ requires costly re repairs. The photo on the left shows an eroding shoreline before stabilization, and the photo on the right shows a mix of rocks and vegetation used to protect the shoreline and prevent erosion. The example site we will create will use a similar technique, but at a site where a bank swallow colony is already established. We hope that we can use this site to show how successful living shorelines can be at preventing erosion, 
and how this more natural method, stabilizing shorelines, can help protect bank swallow nesting habitat. This is especially important because most bank swallow habitat is on private property, which means private landowners have the biggest ability to make changes for their population. And the extra best part about living shorelines, they don't just protect bank swallow habitat, they also benefit aerial insectivores and other native species by creating more natural habitat. For example, they provide a continuous habitat between water and land for fish and wildlife to benefit from. They create and protect marsh habitats that can benefit invertebrates, fish, and other species. They provide food resources and roost sites for, for water birds and food resources for aerial insectivores by creating insect breeding grassland habitat. And living shorelines improve water quality through the filtration of native plant roots from the upper surface into the water. So how can you help these awesome birds? For chimney swifts, if you have a brick or clay chimney, you can help provide nesting and roosting habitat by keeping the top of your chimney open from April to October. Try to clean your chimney in March before spring migration begins and after fall migration ends. If you are renovating your house and you are thinking about getting rid of the chimney, you could consider leaving it up and open for the birds. You can also help by volunteering with us. Our Swift Watch program covers Ontario, Manitoba, Quebec, and the Maritimes, and includes roost monitoring and nest watching. Roost watching occurs annually at known sites across Canada on the dates listed here. Joining a roost watch gives you the opportunity to see thousands of chimney swifts in one location, like in this video, which is extra cool, especially now with how much the species is declining in Canada. Wait for the video to end so you can see how many birds go in. So you can also report casual observations of nests or do presence absence surveys of chimneys in your neighborhood. You never know when you could find a nest, like when I was visiting a friend, a friend's place in downtown Toronto and just happened to see a chimney swift entering this chimney. If you're interested in more information, you can contact us via the two emails listed here, if you live in Ontario or Atlantic Canada, or visit our SwiftWatch website if you live elsewhere. And I believe these are included in that handout, so you can get those there. You can help bank swallows directly by noticing them in the summer and keeping your distance. Bank swallows will often nest near popular beaches or waterways in the summer. If you notice holes along the banks or see bank swallows flying around, please keep your distance from the birds and the colony and please tell others to do the same. Bank swallow colonies are fragile and human disturbances can cause burrows to collapse. It is illegal to harm or disturb the nesting habitat of migratory birds. So if you do see this happening, you can report it. And I have um, the reporting place there. So it's Environment and Climate Change Canada Wildlife Enforcement. If you go to their website, you can find different phone numbers for, for different provinces and, and call in that way. Uh, further, if you're a coastal or waterfront property owner with erosion problems, please consider using natural techniques to help control erosion rather than rock armoring. Uh, you can visit Helping Nature Heal for more information about that. If you live in Atlantic Canada, you can also consider volunteering with us. The Atlantic Canada Bank Swallow Monitoring Program runs from June to July. The only equipment needed is binoculars, a pencil, and a phone or some way to get location information. If you're interested in learning more about this program, you can email me or visit our website on Nature Counts. If you can't volunteer, but you happen to see a bank swallow colony, please report the location to me. My email is listed here and it can be found on the Birds Canada website and the Nature Counts website. You can also volunteer for the Canadian Nightjar Survey. This survey runs from June 15th to July 15th and requires one roadside survey per year. You can learn more about this survey on our website listed on the bottom or sign up to volunteer on Nature Counts. To help all birds and the insects that many birds depend on, you can plant a garden. A bird garden has a few main features, including planting native plants with structural diversity. Native plants use less water and pesticides than non-native plants. Structural diversity includes things like leaving leaf litter, 
adding flowering plants, shrubs, and deciduous and conifer trees to gardens. And the more diverse the garden, the more diverse its inhabitants. Water features are a great addition so that birds can drink and bathe, especially during the hot summer months. And finally, birdhouses can provide nesting habitat for cavity nesters, such as tree swallows. So to help get you started, Birds Canada has created a website, birdgardens.ca, where you can plan your garden, identify what plants are native to your area, see a list of potential bird visitors, and more. One big way to help birds is to turn off your outdoor lights and floodlights at night during spring and fall migration. Each year, billions of birds migrate across North America at night. They use light from the moon and stars to help navigate. When they fly over cities or buildings with bright lights, they can get confused and stuck in the light, leading to disorientation or exhaustion. It can, cause them, it can also cause them to fly into the building's windows. A really sad example of this happened in 2017 in Texas, where over one week, a 32-story building with lights on at night caused 400 passerine birds or songbirds to collide with the windows. Another easy way to help birds is to put stickers on your windows to prevent birds from colliding with them. A 2013 report found that an average of 22.4 million birds die every year in Canada from collisions with windows. During the day, birds will fly into windows if they can see the reflection of trees or vegetation, or if they can see plants inside the window. Nocturnal birds will fly into windows with a light, on, with a light shining through it at night. This is because nocturnal birds use light from the moon to navigate, getting mixed up when they see lights through windows. Stickers on the window break up the reflection and make the glass look like a barrier. In order for stickers to be effective, they need to be placed in a dense five centimeter by five centimeter pattern. They need to be applied to the outside of the window. There needs to be a high contrast between the glass and the stickers. And finally, the stickers have to cover the entire window. You can visit flap.org for more information. Again in 2013, the same report estimated that cats kill an average of 196 million breeding birds annually in Canada. 116 million birds are killed by feral cats and 80 million are killed by domestic pet cats. Cats actually kill more breeding birds in Canada annually than any other source of death. In fact, cat predation, collisions with houses and building windows, and collisions with vehicles and transmission lines all together cause 95% of breeding bird deaths in Canada. You can help with this by keeping cats indoors. If your cat is used to going outside, you can try putting your cat on a leash, like this photo of Frank and Oscar, who are showing all the free ranging cats in their neighborhood that they are getting to explore outside while staying safe from cars, dogs, birds of prey, other cats, wild animals, unfriendly humans, while also helping to keep birds safe. Or you could consider building a cat patio or a catio, like the picture on the right, for your cats to go outside safely. It is hard to tell, but there are actually three cats in this photo relaxing in the fresh air. If you have barn cats or know of a feral colony, you can work with your local humane society if they run a trap or trap neuter return program. Trap neuter return programs humanely reduce the cat population over time and they can receive other medical care if needed. If your cat has to remain outdoors, a study published in 2021 found that providing your cats with high protein food and only five to 10 minutes of play a day will lower the amount of animals that they kill. But it's best just to keep cats indoors. Climate change is impacting us and every species around the globe, and it's having multiple effects on Canada's aerial insectivore populations. You can use your voice to vote for stronger climate action and policies that can help protect us and all birds and animals in Canada. And finally, you can get out and bird. If you're new to birding, here's a list of apps and websites and books that can help you with identifying species. And of course, if you're out birding, there are several places you can report sightings and contribute to citizen science projects like eBird, iNaturalist, and Nature Counts. 
So that's it for me. Uh, so thank you to everyone who made it up to hear this presentation today. And thank you to Watersheds Canada for hosting. Also a big thank you to our partners, funders, and donors that help Birds Canada achieve our conservation goals. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Heather. I'll, I'll get you to just keep your presentation up because I have a few questions here about specific slides. But if people have any questions, now is the time to type them in the chat. You can either post them publicly or send them to Nicole or myself privately, depending on um, what your question is. And before we start the Q&A, Nicole is just going to be dropping a link for a very short feedback survey so that we can learn more about your experience today. And also if you have other topics that you would like us to feature in an upcoming presentation, you're able to put that into the survey. So uh, if you could just take a few minutes to fill that in after the Q&A, that would be greatly appreciated. So Heather, our first question was just to go back to the slide for, I think it was the different types of bird groups and how they've declined over the years. I think it was near the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of slides, take a second. There we go. So the, I know this isn't the focus of your presentation, but perhaps you know the answer or can point people in the right direction. They were just wondering if you knew causes for the grassland birds and the shorebirds for going down as, at such a large percentage. Yeah, I, I, I don't know exact things, but I would assume habitat loss is a major one as well. Um, grasslands are often seen like wetlands kind of as a wasteland that people often look at them and think they're a bit of an eyesore. So grasslands tend to get um, cut and cleared first and then used for, for human landscapes. So I, that's probably a huge part for grassland birds. Uh, for shoreline, shorebirds, I think it's probably more to do with um, shoreline development. Also popular places for humans to be along coasts and shorelines uh, and for golf courses, things like that. So, um, you know, as soon as a beach becomes disturbed by humans or polluted, the shorebirds won't be able to use those areas anymore. Um, but definitely a good place to look for more information on that would just be our Birds Canada website. We have sections on each group and we have people working at conserving each group. So there'd be more information there. Perfect, thank you. We have a question here about the bank swallow populations in Ontario and how they're often breeding in aggregate or gravel pits. So the person is just wondering if Birds Canada or the government is doing anything to engage those aggregate landowners to help protect the breeding habitat. Yeah, great question. So the, the, it, there was a study that was recently done that found that um, bank swallows used to, over 50% of bank swallows used to use aggregate pits as their main breeding habitat. That's since switched back to natural habitats because of changes in regulations for aggregate industries. So originally aggregate industries could just leave their, their um, piles, their like soil piles really steep, but then regulations changed and now they often have to flatten them out before they leave a site. And as I mentioned, bank swallows want 70 degree slopes for their night for their habitat and so if it if it isn't eroding and isn't staying at that 70 degree slope they won't nest there anymore um i think i have it on this slide and uh so they're switching back to their natural habitats um the government of ontario did produce a best management beneficial management practices for pit and quarry operators and they recommend things like keeping the slopes at 70 degrees, um, maybe creating a slope, a sloped face outside of an active area so that the bank swallows will stay away from the active uh, mining and, and pulling up of soils and just stay off the site uh, to encourage them to nest in those locations and stay protected over time. So there are a few things happening, but as far as I know, there is no one monitoring this yet or um, looking at how many bank swallows actually do use pits and quarries in Ontario. 
it's something we're working on in the Atlantic Canada side, and we're hopefully going to have some sort of monitoring project going on out there, uh, specifically at pits and quarries and, and monitoring the colonies there. So it's coming. There are some recommendations, but as far as I know, there's not a ton happening in that uh, field. Thank you. And one thing that I thought was neat, Heather, you might not have known this, but we had actually Helping Nature Heal do a presentation in our freshwater stewardship community last year. And it was all about the importance of living shorelines and how people could do that on their own. So it's going to be something that I include in the additional resources. So if anyone's out in Atlantic Canada, they can reach out to them. I know last year they were also doing some online consultation so if people aren't out there but still want the expertise um, you can reach out to them and then if you're more ontario and saskatchewan and bc we have a program called the natural edge which also focuses on living shorelines so we'll include all those resources in there as well as the bird garden so most of everything Heather's mentioned is going to be in that handout, but if not, we'll be sure to include it in the follow-up email too. There's a lot of great information in here. Yay, that's great. I didn't know about that. Help you need your heal. <laughs> yeah, they're fantastic. Rosemary mm -hmm. gave a wonderful presentation. Great. Uh, we have a few more questions, which I think we'll be able to sneak in these last few minutes here. So someone's asking if there has been any thought about making artificial chimneys for chimney swifts. Yes, and that's part of that Chimney Swift Restoration Fund as well. We, I think there's been one that's happened in New Brunswick. Um, it was a, an old school that had a massive roosting site known for Chimney Swifts, and then the school closed down and it started to fall into disarray. Um, and so we did repair it. And I think we'll know about that one this year. That's one of the ones that was repaired. Um, and then there has been some studies that have done almost like a wooden structure that's just straight up like a big wooden tower uh, and as far as I know those haven't had as much success yet so we're still trying to figure out exactly what makes them want to live in which in certain chimneys and not other ones it's a little bit of a process but there's definitely an opportunity there just requiring more research Okay, the next one is just asking about the nature counts data and if it's added to other databases like iNaturalist or the Atlantic Data Conservation Center. Yes, so we always we make sure to share our um, our data as much as possible. So it does go to the Atlantic uh, ACCDC. I can't think of the, the name for it, but it's an Atlantic Conservation Data Center. Uh, so we send their, our data there every year. It also goes out to the Environment Canada and climate change so that they can help inform their recovery strategies. And our Nature Counts platform actually has it available to anybody. So anyone who wants to download the data can just go onto our Nature Counts website and click download data and it sends me an email. And as long as you give me a legitimate reason as to why you want the data, you're all welcome to have it. So you can um, research bank swallows on your own if you like. <laughs> Great. And you had mentioned throughout the presentation that different birds needed different types of structures. So different nest boxes that people could build. So someone is asking if there are instructions anywhere on the Birds Canada website to know what to build for each species. Yeah, great question. Um, that's maybe something I can send to you after and you could add to the um, the handout. But yes, I'm. we do have instructions somewhere on the Birds Canada website. As I'm sure you could also just Google uh, like tree swallow nest box or purple martin nest box and it would come up with, with what you need. There's a lot of other organizations that have done really great work on figuring out exact requirements to ensure that those species will use those boxes. Um, so it should be something that's relatively easy to find online. Okay, the next question is for groups that are in Atlantic Canada, the Bank Swallow Monitoring Program. So they're asking if you ever work with local watersheds group. For example, they've been associated with a group in PEI that has been monitoring the, the bank swallow cavities for the past four years, but they've never heard about the Atlantic Canada Bank Swallow Monitoring Program. 
Yeah, so it's a relatively new program. As I said, it started in 2022. Um, we are working with partners across every province in Atlantic Canada. So we do have a few partners that are based in PEI and they contribute data and follow, we all follow the same monitoring program so that our data is fully comparable and hopefully gonna give us the best chance at getting population trend estimates. Um, so we are working with as many groups as we can, but if you know of someone and, and uh, think that they'd be interested, feel free to send them my email. We're always looking for more partners. We need all the help we can get. At, um, as I said, this bird species is declining at, you know, we've lost 98% of its population. So the more people that we have that care about the species and that have the ability and the time to monitor them, the better. So um, we're always looking for more partners, absolutely. Great, and the last question we have here is about someone who's observed bank swallow holes in bare cliff faces. So they're wondering if bank swallows prefer these bare cliffs compared to a naturalized green bank. So can they encourage people to prevent erosion by planting or will this actually take away from the habitat that the bank swallows need? Yeah, that's a great question. So they definitely prefer to have it a bare face because um, it does need to be easy for them to dig. And if there's too many plants or tree stumps, it's going to prevent them from digging that that deep burrow that they require. Um, so for, for our living shoreline example that we're going to try to get to hopefully this spring, um, we're going to leave a, a section of the cliff face bare. So about, I think, a, a one meter section along the top of the of the crest for them to be able to dig through. And we're also not going to plant right up to the crest. We're going to give them, I think it's a 0.5 meter, maybe more um, distance away from the crest so that the soil always stays erodible and diggable for them. But the problem is when you leave the bottom below where they nest and it's undercutting all the time from the wave erosion, that's when the colony can collapse. Or if you don't have plants well, kind of along the top, but the back edge of the top, um, it can also increase the water flow over top, which can erode the cliff face that they do need. So there's a few, there's a kind of a balance there of making sure there's enough plants to stabilize it, but also there's enough space for them to still have that eroding surface. So they'll, well, once we have this example site up, it'll be a lot easier for me to answer that question. And we will be sharing all of the, the techniques and every, and results from how this project goes. So you can always keep an eye out for information coming about that stuff. And we can get more and more specific on living shorelines that benefit banks while we'll have time. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions. So thank you so much, Heather, for your time and your expertise. I really liked how you, may, you went all the way through how we can identify them, what's happening to them specifically, and then also different actions that we can take and lots of great programs that Birds Canada is running that other people can get involved with. So like I said, everyone can expect a very comprehensive uh, resource email early next week. And until then, uh, best wishes everyone for your day and your weekend at large. And again, thank you so much, Heather, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. It was really great. And I hope everyone enjoyed it and learned something new. So thank you very much.